Hi everyone, Tundilea here and welcome back to the Africa History Channel where we bring to you snippets of African history from the perspective of Africans themselves. Today, we start a new series where we will explore the history of one of the transnational peoples of Africa, the Fulani, their jihads and the states they created across West Africa. Now let's get started. Different Fulani states rose and lasted from the late 1400s to the early 1900s when the biggest of them fell to the Europeans as they colonized Africa. The series will take us on an epic journey all over West Africa and even touch on how a certain Fulani slave cost a US president his re-election. While they are called different names depending on where in West Africa they are, Fulu, Piu, Pula, Pola, Hapula, Takolos, Fulbe, Fula, Felata. I've chosen to stick with how they mostly self-identify, Fulbe, and how they are identified by the Hausa in my native Nigeria, Fulani, in this series. For most people, when we talk about the Fulani Jihads and the states that they formed, it is the most successful of these states, the Sokoto Caliphate, that spanned parts of northern Nigeria, Southern Niger Republic and Northern Cameroon, founded by Uthman Danfodio in 1804 and which lasted for about 99 years until it fell to the British in 1903 that comes to the minds of most people. But Sokoto was only one of the Fulani Islamic states founded in West Africa. It was neither the first nor was it the last. There were at least six Fulani Islamic states as well as one that was non-Islamic over a nearly 400 year period that lasted from late 1400s into the early 1900s in the area from the western coast of modern day Senegambia all the way to what is today Cameroon. This area is what roughly coincides with the Sahel today. The first Fulani state recorded was known as the Empire of the Great Fulu, a befitting name, established by a warrior known as Tengela in 1490. It was non-Muslim Fulani and the ruling dynasty, which was also non-Muslim Fulani, was known as the Dayan King and their state lasted all the way into 1776 when the Dayan King rulers would be overthrown by their increasingly Muslim Fula subjects under the influence of the Islamic scholarly Fulani clan known as the Torodbe to establish the third of the Fulani jihadi states in the Futatoro area. In the area of West Africa, where the Fulani would come to hold sway, prior to the 1500s, they lived under a series of great empires. These empires grew rich from controlling the key southern reaches of the trans-Saharan trade in gold, salts, slaves, and other items, as well as control of gold and salt mines in the West Africa area. These empires were founded by Mande groups, such as the Sonike, Mandinka, Soso, and Bambara. Traders brought Islam to these empires, and in some of them, the ruling elite also became Muslims. Each time these empires became very rich, the Arab Berber states to the north would eventually come down in multiple raids that ended up fragmenting the states. But the economic and geopolitical fundamentals of the flat, fertile plain of the area drained by one of the biggest rivers in the world, the great Niger River, was such that in no time a new empire would emerge, rising from one of the subject states of the previous empire after an intense struggle among these fragments. Many of the biggest cities followed the banks of the Niger. Timbuktu, the ancient seat of trade and learning called the crown jewel of the Sahel, was at the northern bend of the Niger River. And Gao, which became the capital of the largest of these Sahelian empires, the Songhai, also started as a fishing village on the banks of the Niger. The first empire with extensive records in the area was the Great Ghana Empire, or as they call themselves, the Wagadu Empire, founded by the Sonike people, with their capital in the twin city of Kumbi Saleh. It was located primarily in present-day Mauritania and Western Mali, and not in the modern country of Ghana that inherited its name. 
It lasted from around the year 300 until the year 1077 when it was sacked by the Almoravids of Morocco under Abu Bakr ibn Umar. A key piece of information with regards to this episode from the Ghana period is the record of the languages they spoke in the empire. These included Sonike, the language of the ruling dynasty, Arabic, which was the language of trade in the period, Malinke, Mande, and of course, Fulfude, as recorded by Ibn Khaldun, the Arab historian and adventurer who visited the area in the 1300s just after the collapse of Ghana. Fufude, as we know, is the language of the Fulani. We can therefore conclude that as early as in the days of the Ghana Empire, the Fulani were already a significant ethnic group in the area. In addition, around the same time Ghana flourished, the relatively small state of Takro lay to its west. The leaders were Fulani. It was contemporary to Ghana, but it would outlast the Ghana Empire. Takro was the origin of people in the area calling some branches of Fulani Takolo. After the fall of the Ghana Empire, the Almoravids did not stay long. Immediately, the empire's constituents began a struggle to occupy the vacuum its collapse had left. Another Mande group, the Soso, led by Sumaro Kante, came to dominate the area, occupying the Ghanaian capital of Kumbisale and ruling from there. But their dominance will not last for long. In 1235, a third Mande group, we now call the Mandinka, who were not ready to accept the harsh rule of the Soso, and so they recalled their exiled prince, Sunjata Keita, to lead them to freedom. He returned and organized the Mandinka, entering into a pact with the warlords he met in the Mandinka heartland in the plain of Sibi to take on the Soso. Sunjata's Mandinka coalition met with Sumaro in the Battle of Kirina in the same year, 1235, and the Mandinka won, establishing the now famous Mali Empire. The story is recorded in the Epic of Sunjata, still sung by Groits in Mali. The empire lasted in its imperial form from this period until the early 1500s, when other rising states began to chip away at its territory. While it diminished Mali would continue up till 1670, when its capital, Niani, would eventually be burnt down, these ascendant states began to take preeminence from the early 1500s. Crucially, it will be the first time that non-Mande peoples will take the lead in empire building in the area. Two of these states are of interest to our Rise of the Fulani people story. The first we have already met, the Fulani-led non-Islamic Great Fulu Empire that was established in 1490 under the Dayanke dynasty. The second emerged from a fishing village which we have already also talked about, Gao. And this empire, the Songhai, was established by Sonia Ali in 1464 as Mali began to weaken. The Songhai would go on to become the largest of these West African Sahelian empires, stretching from the western Atlantic coast of West Africa in present-day Senegambia all the way to the Hausa-speaking states in present-day northern Nigeria and as far north as Mauritania. We will return to Songhai as we proceed in the series. For now, let's stay with the Great Fulu Empire. The empire began when the Fulani nomads, led by Tengela, left their homeland in the Futajalon Highlands and migrated northwards into the fertile Futatoro area. They were driven first by the desire to escape their overbearing Mande Jalonke overlords and the opportunity to take land from the now weakened Mali Empire attacking and occupying its most western portions that bordered the Atlantic coast. Tengala used the same title the Mali rulers used, Mansa, and styled himself after them, perhaps signifying that he saw himself as their successor. He would go on to clash with another rising power that we mentioned earlier, the Songhai, who were also former Mali subjects. Unfortunately, he was killed in battle against Songhai in 1512. His son, Koli Tengela, succeeded him, ruling from this time until 1537. He was successful against another people there, the Wolof of the Jolof Empire to the south of the Great Fulu Empire. It is this Jolof Empire we get the name of a favorite dish across West Africa, Jolof rice, from. Taking advantage of the internal fractures amongst these Wolof, 
Holy Tengela took their lands in Futatoro, in present-day Senegal, to expand his domain, part of Koli's justification, of course, was that this land had originally belonged to the small Fulani-led Takro states, which we mentioned earlier, which the Jolof Empire had taken it from. However, when he tried to take advantage of ongoing dynastic struggles and civil war in the now dominant Songhai Empire to take over Mali's Bambuk gold fields to the southeast, he would be defeated by the Songhai, and like his father, he will be killed in battle. In spite of this, however, the animist Great Fulu would maintain their independence from the Songhai, only ceding a small strip of land that gave the Songhai access to the Atlantic coast. When the Fulani that established the Great Fulu arrived in Futatoro, they met another clan of Fulani already present there. This clan was known as the Torodbe, a contraction of Torofulbe or sometimes they were called the Torunkawa, further to the west in Hausa land. They are taking up Islam under the Ghana Empire from about the 900s and up until the 1500s. By the 1500s, when their animist conquering brethren arrived, the Torodbe had been Muslims for about 600 years. In this time, they had become a clan of Islamic clerics, patterned after the Zawaya clan that had emerged earlier amongst the northern Arab and Berber tribes based in Mauritania, who had or originally brought Islam to the area. The warrior class in the Great Fulu, who were mostly animists, looked down on these bookish scholars who preferred to live on charity. They would say of the Torodbe, if the begging Kalabash did not exist, the Torodbe would not survive. They would be very, very wrong. The Torodbe may have been remnants of the Takro who remained in the region after their state declined. These literate and educated Torodbe clerics bristled under the rule of their animist brethren in the Great Fulu Empire for nearly 200 years until the 1670s when they became involved in the revolt of their northern Zawaya clerical counterparts in modern day Mauritania against the Arab Berber warrior class there. The revolt of the Zawaya precipitated from years of oppression and heavy taxation by this warrior class, in spite of both being Muslims and from the Arab Berber stock. The Zawaya were initially successful in 1673, but they were ultimately defeated in 1674 by the forces of Hassan of Ida Aish in Mauritania. Most of the Torodbe that had fought on the side of the Zawaya in this jihad returned to their homes in Futatoro, determined to emulate their Zawaya colleagues and carry out revolutionary jihad in the Great Fulu Empire to free the Muslim Fulani from the rule of their animist Fulani overlords. The first of these jihads would occur in 1677, only three years after they returned, with Zawaya support. However, this attempt would fail woefully and the Torodbe would be soundly defeated by the animist warrior class. The defeat led to a dispersal of the Torodbe far and wide across the area, carrying the ideas of Islamic Jihad and the lessons from their failed attempt at establishing an Islamic state through Jihad. Thirteen years later, they will try again and this time they will not fail. In the next episode, we enter the period of the first of the successful Fulani Islamic states, the small Bundu Imamate. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching and hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, to share and to subscribe with everybody in your network as we talk about African history more and more. See you next time.